Okay, so this is the third year I've gotten up to talk about phylogenetic trees and their virtues, and this will be no different. So taxonomy and systematics are the pillars of biodiversity and conservation science. Recognition of species based on shared derived characters is the basis for assessments of local, regional, and global species richness. This in turn informs uh, assemblage provinciality and how we prioritize conservation strategies. Taxonomy and systematics are intrinsically linked and both are informed by robust phylogenetic um, trees. Insufficient taxonomic research uh, or Insufficient taxonomic research or an artificially stable taxonomy can undermine conservation efforts by mis misdirecting resources away from most threatened or ecologically important species. And so I want to address the elephant on the reef. We have no clue how many species of corals there are in the Great Barrier Reef, where their genetic limits are, where their geographic limits are, how they're related to each other. We just don't know. Don't get me wrong, okay, I'm a fish phylogeneticist, okay, so you might say, how how do I have the right to say something like this? Well, I've collaborated with some coral taxonomists and it's very hard to get them to agree on anything. Um, but what we, can t what we can say is there are a lot of um, uh, traits that are used to distinguish species in the field, but these traits or these morphological groups that they're placed in that do not reflect uh, phylogenetic relationships or systematics. They're Many people say there, many people agree that there's problems with coral taxonomy, especially species that have relationships, and some of these um, problems are historical. So if you look at the number of um, species of corals that have been uh, in the genus Acropora alone, uh, so the staghorn corals, if you look at the number of species that have been described through the years, um, so nominal species or species that are first described based on a holotype specimen uh, go up and up, but uh, when there's these uh, taxonomic revisions done, you can see that a lot of the time these revisions um, uh, are result in synonymies being lumped into different species baskets. And so how, uh, one example of this is um, uh, Millipora. So uh, the type specimen for a cropper Millipora is a Heteropora Millipora, but there are also a lot of very uh, other names that, ha that have been described before. And these have been, at different stages, some of them have been ele elevated to species and then they've been synonymized or back again. So how certain are we that all of these are not individual species. What are their genetic limits? We just don't know. And so common species on the GBR have many synonymies, okay, that have been described. So how sure are we that these are not um, separate species? So overall, there's been uh, 412 nominal species. Um, 122 have been accepted, uh, 210 are synonymized, and eight are unresolved. So this means that there's at least 290 nominal species that aren't in books, okay? So this means if you are swimming over the reef and you see a coral that you can't see in the book, it may already have been described somewhere and it might be a synonymy or unresolved. So when we look at the genetic data, so 20 years of Sanger sequencing has resulted in, in some scrap of DNA available for at least 46% of species accepted in the family of Cropperidae. So in the family of Cropperidae, there is 280 currently accepted species, but there's 700 nominal species. And so if we look at this data that's available, it's not equal, okay? There's uh, not every species is sampled for every um, uh, uh, genetic or every gene and so you can see on this uh, graph over here and um, that there's most and also most of this is mitochondrial data uh, there's uh, one um, nuclear marker there uh, but when we look at the makeup of different um, the data that's available for different coral families so this is if you imagine every row here is a species and every column is a gene you can see that there's a lot of missing data okay um, and uh, Again, a lot of this is mitochondrial data, and so mitochondrial genes have been shown to have um, atypically slow substitution rates in corals. And actually, in octocorals, they've found that the octocorals are actually able to repair the mitochondrial. So uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you found this in corals as well. And that means that there's just not enough variation to, uh, to look at these things in detail. So when you look at uh, some mitochondrial trees that have been, um, that have been uh, reconstructed, you can see that they have these polytomies that uh, you don't get a lot of resolution. Um, but despite this, there are several genome, full genomes available for coral species online. And um, yet, not every one of these has a, um, a type specimen or even a picture of them. So basically, what are our problems? Basically, we need to discuss, uh, we need to look at nominal species and accepted species, trying to understand how many of these species are actually um, genetically different in, in the wild. 
Um, morphology does not indicate systematics or phylogenetic relationships. There's a low molecular sampling and resolution, and this mitochondrial mutation rate means that we need to look at nuclear markers, but there's been little development of nuclear markers. So welcome to Project Phoenix. Okay, this is um, part of my DECRA work. I've collaborated with uh, Andrew Baird and Tom Bridge and Andrea Quattrini. And basically, we've decided, you can, you can guess who came up with the Project Phoenix idea. Um, so rising from the ashes of um, old coral taxonomy. Um, so we are prioritizing, <laughs> not, um, sampling nominal species across the range. We're prioritizing topotypes. So that's basically a specimen that um, uh, looks exactly like the holotype from the holotype location. And then we're looking at variations within that as well. Uh, we're targeting new nuclear markers. So this is targeted capture. We're looking at, um, I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Um, but we're also able to harvest these markers from whole genomes to place those in a phylogenetic context. And we're, going to ident we're identifying species boundaries, looking at new species, old species. And so I'm going to give you the results first, just in case I go over time. So in the family of Cropper Day, we've uh, collected to, uh, three, over 320 uh, specimens, phylogenetic data, phylogenomic data. We've got over 14,000 loci, and this includes ultra-conserved elements and exons. Uh, it's shown us robo robust genus-level relationships. Within a Cropper, we found six robust molecular clades. Um, looking at trying to identify species level hypotheses, we've, we have 164 secondary species hypotheses, and this means that we've used the branching pattern and tree and other data to kind of like decide, okay, do these look like separate species? 58 of these are accepted species, 47 have, been, have to be resurrected from synonymy, and there's at least 59 new or unknown species. And whole genomes, well, those IDs need to be confirmed. Okay, sampling location. So this is, a, we've sampled across the Indo-Pacific. Um, so in green are where we sample, in red are where we're going to sample. And we've implemented this open nomenclature um, as we're identifying these things in the field. So uh, we, we're, only, we're only giving a species name or a, an accepted species name or, or a, a nominal species name if we're able to compare it to the holotype material and it looks the exact same. Um, we've got new species, uh, so we also have variations of things that look like a, a species but may, may not be exactly like a type species, so this is CF or has affinities to, and then there's just things that we're, we're not confident uh, at all uh, um, of where they're placed. Uh, so we're using uh, ultra-conserved elements. These are highly conserved areas of uh, organism genomes that share uh, that are shared among evolutionary distinct taxa. Um, so basically the idea is you line up all your model genomes that have been produced, you identify these areas that are 95 to 100% um, conserved, and then you identify, uh, you design probes to target those regions, and using uh, high throughput NGS methods, you can pull out those uh, UCE cores and the flanking regions, and it's the variability in those flanking regions that are really useful for phylogenetics. And we're also able to uh, look at um, uh, targeting these um, uh, exon markers as well. And so this has been done in uh, Anthrozoa, and so this was a paper by our collaborator, Andrea Quattrini, and so she's since redesigned the bait set to target hexachorals, and so um, we're able to, we're, we've included more geno uh, more acropora genomes in these, um, uh, in this uh, bait design. We've also screened out 141 loci that might overlap with the symbiodenium genome. Um, so what we have so far is uh, these, um, We've, we've got a lot of data, um, <laughs> millions of base pairs, and so what we're able to do is form these 95% complete matrices or 75% complete matrices, and basically um, this tree here is just showing a, a, some traditional, um, uh, the, so the relationship between the, the genera within a crop per day, uh, some interesting things, uh, Anacropora uh, is Montipora, um, and Alveopora is, uh, is a sister to Montipora, and this was just um, uh, released uh, using phyla transcriptomic data as well, so it's nice to see some, uh, some overlap there. And um, we've got lots of variable sites that are able to inform uh, the relationships here. So even among families, they're 46%. And um, so the outgroup families I have here are fungids, agarisids. We're also doing this with black corals as well, so that's some, some new data that, that we've just gotten back. Um, so just to kind of put in context how much data this is, uh, so here is 20 years of Sanger sequencing for a crop per day. Uh, and here is three years of sequencing of UCEs and exons, and you can see it's quite, um, uh, quite a lot more data than has been produced previously. Uh, so what is the tree looking like? Um, so we've got high bootstrap support of clades, so we have these individual clades here. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, they seem to have, that you've got two clades, clades A and B here seem to be very diverse, and uh, they're the more derived clades. Um, but they, they have uh, high bootstrap support for, these, um, for this uh, arrangement. 
Um, also, this, so this is just a graph of uh, the number of UCEs and exons that have been captured for these. So on average, it's 1,400. Uh, so we got these more complete alignments. And we're also able to target, we're also to pull out mitochondrial data from the off reads. And I've even found some symbiodinium reads in there. So potentially, this could be a way forward to actually sequence the, the, uh, the host and the symbiont as well. Uh, so in terms of morphological groups, uh, so if we look at the Acropa robusta group, uh, here's some of the species. Uh, here's where they're found on the tree. They're just all over the place. And found in different clades as well. Uh, so what are these clades? Well, uh, Tom Bridges put some names on these, and he spent a lot of time looking at this tree. And he, he'd like me to say that um, these, uh, we're, we're starting to get this resolution at this clade level, but we're still working a lot at the tips. Um, but we're really, these, this data is really impressive at the moment. And so uh, uh, these are some of the things that you find in these clades. Uh, some of the, some of the uh, names are pretty interesting. Uh, but one of the, so I'm just going to run through a couple of, of uh, interesting things we found. So this is um, so data from, uh, from uh, Andrew Baird. Um, I think he presented this at ICRS last night, and he bemoaned the fact that he has morphological and breeding trials data that distinguishes these, um, these three species, Hyacinthus, Bifurcata, and Scytheria, but that the current molecules couldn't show that they were different. Well, here we finally have a method that actually distinguishes these. Now, you will notice there's lots of other things in between there, but I will point out where the Hyacinthus genome that's currently available lies. It's uh, quite distant from uh, this clade of Hyacinthus. Uh, so sp sticking with these um, harvested genomes, uh, so we have a couple of, we have the, um, the Millipora genome from JCU group, and then this is uh, from Zachary Fuller, I think, uh, released this genome. And so you can see that they're grouping together in this Millipora-like thing, but there's also like all these other s things that look like the synonyms and, or the other um, nominal species that are in there. So we really need to um, look at what these actual species are. Okay, um, what's this one? so again, here we have um, the Digitifera genome. Um, and again, it's, it's, there's other things that look like Digitifera in this tree, and it's not, like there, there's, there's variation within there. Um, there's some nice things as well. Uh, uh, Acropora solitariensis forms a really nice clade here, and so these are multiple different species, and so it's nice when, we, when we're getting that sort of structure. Oh yeah, and um, down here are the two Caribbean species. So in a lot of trees, the Caribbean species have been placed quite um, at, the, at, the, at the bottom of the tree, um, but so this, um, our results are, sh are showing that it's uh, within uh, that, that clade. Uh, moving on, um, so again, we're, we're, sample, we're trying to sample all these top of type specimens and then comparing these to, uh, to um, the other specimens and variability and then looking at the tree to see are these, are these species the same thing. Um, again, we have the tenuous genome up here. Um, and so we can't confirm that it's a tenuous, that that's uh, a proper tenuous until we get a type specimen for it. And so we're basically, we still get a lot of work at the, at the tips here, but we're, we're, so, we're seeing that when we do have type specimens and things that look like type specimens from other, from other areas, that uh, they are coming out as monophyletic, whereas there's still a lot of variability and some of this variability is actually looks like to be genetically distinct. Okay, so we're getting some phylogeographic patterns as well. Uh, so some of the species are coming out. And so basically the Red Sea and places like Lord Howe are quite distinct and we're finding a lot of uh, distinct lineages there. Um, this is still preliminary work. We still need to sample um, uh, in the Indian Ocean and in the Central and the Pacific as well. Okay, so uh, just to kind of finish up, taxonomy systematics are critical. Phylogenetics informs both. Uh, coral phylogenetics have been plagued for decades by stagnant species level taxonomy, incomplete sampling, uh, lack of markers, slow mitochondria. We think targeted capture of UCEs and exons is a viable option. We're getting hundreds of thousands of markers and it's resolving deep and shallow clades. Um, so for Acropora, we have six molecular clades. There seems to be some rapid diversification in these derived uh, clades of tables. Um, so top of types vouchers, pictures are crucial for ID and species definition uh, spe and defining boundaries. And whole genome approaches are, are promising and gives a lot of data, but we really need to have accurate taxonomy, especially if they're going to be used for, for things in the future. Uh, I'd just like to thank all my collaborators, all the coral creatures, the fish folk, uh, my research assistants and students. And just thank you for the center. For, it's, uh, it's been great being here. I've uh, been back at Townsville uh, for th three or four years now, oh my God. And uh, yeah, thank you very much.